the day before the Criterion sale, the couple called me and they were like, we're going to be out of town. <laughs> can you watch our dog? And I was like, yes, I can. And then the next day, the next day was the Criterion flash sale. So I got some things because <laughs> I was planning on, on not getting anything, just missing out on this one. And then I was like, oh, but I'm going to be watching the dog. So I'm going to get a paycheck from that. So I used some of the money that I don't have yet <laughs> to get some titles. Um, also, I hate the way my hair looks right now. It just dried really oddly <laughs> and I have to address it because it just looks so bad. Um, other than it's, I mean, it's fading. It's been like three weeks, but if you didn't <laughs> see on my Instagram story a handful of days after I did it, the side of my hair dyed it. Well, it's blue dye, but it turns out green because of the golden hue of my hair. And then the side was pink. Literally, it it does not show up on camera very well. Like I did that and you can't even tell. <laughs> oh, anyway, yeah, I got four things. So the first thing I have here is Being There, directed by Hal Ashby. Oh my God, it's like so dark in this corner. I hate this. This is not the time to be contemplating a different filming setup. It's just, it's the angle too. I, it, I just have stuff everywhere. <laughs> okay. Being There, directed by Hal Ashby uh, from 1979. It is spine number 864. I recently rewatched Harold and Maude, which is one of my favorite movies, and I watched that with a group of friends for uh, my movie marathon group that I've mentioned before. So rewatching Harold and Maude just made me want to like explore more of Hal Ashby's filmography. I think this is the only other film of his that I'm familiar with, and I barely know anything about it. Have not watched any of these yet, by the way. I almost started, I did start this one, but I didn't finish it. I didn't get more than a handful of minutes into it because it said based on a novel and I went oh I didn't <laughs> I didn't know that so I looked it up and the audiobook is available on YouTube so I'm going to listen to that and then watch the movie I'm gonna have to wait a week because I'm not bringing this with me while I'm dog sitting but that's okay what I do know about being there though is the main character's name is Chance I think he's a gardener and he just becomes like really famous for like no reason. <laughs> I think something like that. Why do I also feel like there's something to do with like the president? But I'm, oh, maybe it just takes place in Washington, DC. I mean, it does, but maybe that's just why I had the idea of a president. I think he just becomes really well known for some reason. Or for no reason. He just becomes really well known. I feel like it'll be really heartwarming too. And it'll be interesting to compare, like, because Chance is kind of an older character. It'll be interesting to compare him to, like, Maude in Harold and Maude. Because obviously she's, like, she turns 80 in that film. So now I'm, I'm even more excited because I'm just thinking about, like, old characters or older characters who are, like, really charming and fun. And I just have a feeling that Chance will be adorable and and charming and then i also got death in venice directed by lucina visconti from 1971 spine number 962 wow these are both almost the same length this is 130 minutes and this one is 131 minutes um also criterion has a really interesting video um pertaining to the making of the artwork for this cover so um it's actually a statue that the artist made and then they made a photo <laughs> they took a photo of it and made a print for the cover which i think is so interesting because you would think that it's just a painting but it's a statue it's that's very cool um i'll have to rewatch that video probably after i watch the movie which isn't going to happen probably <laughs> until the summer this is based on a novel that there there are a handful of books that i would like to read this summer because they just feel like summer books to me um, that have adaptations that I really want to watch. And this is one of them. <laughs> Did I phrase that well? I like forgot how I started the sentence. But yeah, Death in Venice is based on the novel of the same title. But I think actually it's a novella. But anyway, it's by Thomas Mann. I actually don't have that one yet, which is so funny because the other movies that I was thinking about getting uh, that I ended up deleting from my cart just, you know, as I was narrowing things down, I have those books, but I don't have Death in Venice yet. <laughs> uh, but I figured, especially since I kind of haven't planned for the summer, 
I'll just get those during the Barnes & Noble sale, you know, the Criterion Barnes & Noble sale, especially because I usually always get something during the summer, considering my birthday is in June, and I usually get some money for my birthday from family and friends, and that usually goes towards books, movies, K-pop things, um, so, oh my god, I have to pre-order Suho's new album, sorry, okay, I just remembered, all right, it's in chat, okay, great, <laughs> mm, yeah, so money for my birthday will go towards some movies that are adaptations of books that I have not read yet, much like this one, and I thought that I would just, like, show you this book that I have, because it's, it seems really interesting, it'll be I'm trying to figure out when I should read it. Like, probably pretty soon after, probably after watching Death in Venice. Obviously after reading Death in Venice, but I have this book called The Magician. Oh man, I forget how to, I don't know how to say this author's name for sure because he's Irish, so I don't know if there's like weird pronunciation, but for now I just say Colm Toybin, even though I have not actually looked up if that's correct. The Magician, this came out last year. And it is about um, Death in Venice, and Thomas. it's about Thomas Mann. It is considered historical fiction, but I'm sure a bunch of research went into this. And a previous book of his is called The Master, which is about Henry James. So that would also be interesting to read. Um, I have not yet read one of his books. I have Brooklyn, and it's... I just haven't read it yet, okay? Here, it's... it's literally right in front of me. Brooklyn. But I think a lot of people are familiar with that because of the movie from 2015, I want to say? 2015, 2016? Uh, with Sir Ronan? Yeah. Anyway, I thought I would read the blurb thing, <laughs> the synopsis for this, just because I just found it so fascinating. Then I'll tell you what Death and Venice is sort of, I only know like a little bit about it, so. It says, Colm Toivin's spectacular new novel opens in the provincial German city at the turn of the 20th century, where a boy, Thomas Mann, grows up with a conservative father, bound by propriety, and a Brazilian mother alluring and unpredictable. Young Mann hides his artistic aspirations from his father and his homosexual desires from everyone. He is infatuated with the son of one of the richest, most cultured Jewish families in Munich and marries the daughter. I don't think I fully processed that sentence when I previously read this synopsis. Okay. <laughs> he and Katya have six children, and the novel Budenbrooks... Budenbrooks? Is that how you pronounce that? I don't know. In the novel Budenbrooks, which is one of Thomas Mann's novels, uh, he writes about his own family. On a holiday in Italy, he longs for a boy he sees on a beach and writes the novella Death in Venice. When Katya spends six months in a sanatorium, he writes The Magic Mountain. He is the most successful novelist of his time, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, a public man whose private life remains secret. He is expected to lead the condemnation of Hitler, whom he underestimates, his oldest daughter and son, leaders of bohemianism and of the anti-Nazi movement, share lovers. In 1933, the mans flee Germany for Switzerland, France, and ultimately America, living first in Princeton, New Jersey, and then in Los Angeles. In a stunning marriage of research and imagination, Toybin explores the heart and mind of a writer whose gift is unparalleled and whose life is riven by a need to belong and the anguish of illicit desire. The Magician is an intimate, astonishingly complex portrait of man, his magnificent wife Katya, and the times in which they lived, the First World War, the rise of Hitler, World War II, the Cold War, and exile. This is a man and a family fiercely engaged by the world, profoundly flawed and unforgettable. As People magazine said about The Master, which is the book about Henry James, it's a delicate, mysterious process, this act of creation, fraught with psychological tension, fraught with psychological tension, and Toybin captures it beautifully. And then his author photo has him with his, like, hands on his head. <laughs> like, why was that the choice? Why was this... <laughs> Why? Why? Isn't that so interesting, though? So it'll be, I think, I'll read Death in Venice, I'll watch Death in Venice, I'll read The Magician, and then I will look up information on Thomas Mann. 
Although I'll probably, you know, after watching Death in Venice, I will also um, watch the supplements, of course. And so it briefly mentioned Death in Venice about how he goes to Italy and sees a boy. And that is like <laughs> essentially the premise of Death in Venice, or at least what I know. I don't think there's a lot in terms of like plot to me from what I get <laughs> from other people from... I don't know, this is just a consensus that I've come to. It seems more like a sort of contemplative story. Kind of like, kind of like a single man. That's the only thing that I can think of in terms of a comparison. If you've read A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood. Where is that? It's somewhere behind me. <laughs> and then that was also turned into a movie in 2009 with Colin Firth. I know this is about a composer who goes to Italy and he sees a boy who is beautiful and he desires. And oh yes, and then also I would like to watch the documentary uh, The Most Beautiful Boy in the World, I'm pretty sure is what it's called. And it's about the casting, like finding the search for the person, the boy to play the boy in the movie, um, who ends up being played by, oh, uh, Bjorn... Anderson? It's like B-J-O-R-N and then the O has the two dot like accent mark over it so I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. And then also Dirk Bogart plays the composer and um I really like him. <laughs> uh, I've watched a mm, yeah like a good number of his films I feel like over the past like year and a half. It all started with like The Servant in October of 2020. <laughs> Time. Okay, yes. Anyway, he's in this and I'm looking forward to seeing it because I've seen a number of things that he is in. Uh, and then the third thing that I got is The Furies. This was somewhat recently upgraded, like kind of recently, right? Like sometime last year. So it's, it's by number 435, but it was only previously available on DVD. Uh, the Furies, directed by Anthony Mann from 1950. And I don't know, westerns are kind of hit or miss for me, but I feel like a couple of things. With The Power of the Dog coming out, it's kind of piqued my interest in westerns, especially because I do, there are, the westerns that I do like, I really like, and then the westerns that I don't like, I really don't like. <laughs> um, and I, by the way, I have not actually seen Power of the Dog, I have the book right here. This is... <laughs> These are some new books that I got. I was contemplating getting the audiobook for Power of the Dog, and then I was like, no, I feel like I, it's kind of like more psychological and I would like to read it physically, especially so I can annotate. Again, with the Power of the Dog coming out, piqued my interest in Westerns again, um, even though I guess I've, I've never really been like that interested in them. But also Nathan, uh, Nathan Hale from Nathan Hale Classics, he does these 25 movie challenges where he sort of sets himself a theme. Usually it's kind of like random. He'll have like a few ideas and then he'll put them in one of those like random wheel generator things, if you know what I'm talking about, and then it'll be chosen for him. And uh, his 25 movie challenge currently is Westerns um, because that's a genre that he hasn't really delved into a lot. So um, he's been, I've been seeing updates on Letterboxd and if he talks about them in videos on his channel, then I've been watching those. <laughs> so yeah, Westerns, Westerns are in the sphere of the sphere. <laughs> anyway, The Furies, um, also I got this because it comes with the book, which is out of print. Like I am pretty sure you cannot get this any other way except for the Criterion release. It may, maybe it's available like on ebook, but I'm not sure. It comes with a book, so I don't have to worry about getting it, but I'm pretty sure there is not a physical book of this available. So I don't know how long this, this is going to be run for in terms of the printing of this, um, because I know that Picnic at Hanging Rock, Red River, those don't come with the books anymore, but I have editions. I have the Criterion releases with the books, and, and there may be more that I don't know off the top of my head right now. So, um, oh my god, I keep doing that. I just noticed. <laughs> Sometimes I'll get like kind of quieter and then get that sort of like, mm, <laughs> like half vocal fry, half kind of like 
rocky sound in my voice. I hate when I do that. Oh my god, there was a video I was editing and I was like, stop doing that, Bailey. Sorry. The Furies, a novel by Niven Bush. I'll just read the back of this to you. With his novel, with his novel Duel in the Sun from 1946. I'm Have I seen that one? I don't remember. Um, and his screenplay for Raoul Walsh's Pursuit from 1947, Niven Bush brought the Western into decidedly Freudian territory, marrying the genre's rugged exteriors with equally untamed psychologies. Is this a thing? Because I was literally just mentioning how The Power of the Dog is a little bit more psychological. Is this, like, more prevalent than I realized? Anyway, let me know what you think. <laughs> Uh, this says, first published in 1948, the Furies continued his revisionist streak with the thundering tale of Vance Jefford, tough right hand and hot-blooded heiress to her beloved patriarch, ruthless New Mexico cattle baron T.C. Jefford. Sorry, I'm doing a terrible job of reading this. But when her widower father brings home a new flame, Vance's simmering jealousy threatens to shatter trust. Yes. Shatter trust, draw blood, and bring ruin to the clan. Bush's page-turner saga of hot passion and cold vengeance envisions an Old West that was truly wild. He was a screenwriter, novelist, and producer. He began his career in journalism, but swiftly moved into screenplay work, including 1946's adaptation of James Cain's uh, the Postman Always Rings Twice. His best-known novel, Duel in the Sun, was produced for the screen in 1946 by David O. Selznick. The Furies was adapted for Timothy Mann in 1950. Niven Bush. Bush? It's B-U-S-C-H. But I feel like that's usually pronounced Bush. It's Barbara Stanwyck and Walter Houston who are the, like, father and daughter. And vivid supporting turns from Judith Anderson, Wendell Corey, and Gilbert Rowland just to name some other actors who are in it. And so the last thing that I have here is actually the one thing that I knew I was going to get um, once I actually decided that I was going to be getting things from the flash sale, and that is Eric Romer's Six Moral Tales. The enunciation there was terrible. Eric Romer. Eric Romer. Good enough. Okay, there you go. That's... His six moral tales. <laughs> so this includes six movies and also the stories that he wrote first. There we go. So he wrote these first and I'm, I think I heard that like the publishers were iffy about it or like didn't actually publish them. I'm, I need to look up the, I'll probably learn through the supplements on here, but he wrote these stories and then apparently they were like really cinematic and the publishers were like at least wary about publishing them because they didn't think it would work well in book form. So he made them into movies. I think. <laughs> okay. It comes with the stories that he wrote, which is really cool. Um, and then obviously these, these stories are the six movies in the box set. There is The Bakery Girl of Monceau from 1963, Suzanne's Career also from 1963, My Night at Maud's from 1969, La Collectionneuse from 1967, Claire's Knee from 1970, and Love in the Afternoon from 1972. I don't really know what any of these are about other than like just kind of ideas that I get from those titles, but I... I'm really excited to dive into this. This has been on my wish list since I got into Criterion, but it was only available on DVD. And because it, it's by number 342. First, it was a box set that like really intrigued me when I first got into Criterion, but then also I don't really know that much about Eric Romer. So um, just getting to know him and his work, especially because I love French films. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that. I didn't even need to say that, did I? <laughs> French films from the 60s, and he is a director of the French New Wave, and he's one of those directors that I just, like, have not delved into, and I'm not sure. I've also just, like, forgotten a lot of information that I learned when I first got into the French New Wave, but I'm not sure, like, where he is in terms of... I don't know, in terms of the French New Wave, because, you know, there's, like, the the left bank and the right bank, and then also there are certain directors that are kind of associated with the French New Wave, but aren't actually directors of it. This always bothers me, <laughs> especially because I remember reading 
something that Jacques Demy said that, like, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he was literally like, I'm not part of the French New Wave, but people associate him with it anyway. I think just because he made films and he was in France, um, at this, he making films at, around the same time. And Agnès Varda is also kind of associated with the French New Wave, but she also, like, kind of isn't a part of it. And I just, like, I don't know, maybe those are just, like, the sources that I read information from, and then other people are reading other sources. I'm really gonna have to, uh, refresh my memory on some things. It'll, I'm interested in figuring out where Eric Romare is in terms of all of that, if that makes sense. I have to finish packing now, so thank you for watching. Tell me what you got um, from the sale and what you think of these, if you've seen any of them. What are your thoughts? What interests you if you haven't seen any of them? So yeah, I have to go. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!